citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voices. Welcome, oh, welcome everyone to a very to special episode of the People Powered Planet Podcast, yeah. where each week we have amazing solutionaries. Uh, we have people who, like, like Barbara Mueller, who's been on before, who has a couple more P's. Peace is possible. People Powered Planet Podcast, Peace is Possible. <laughs> How many P's can we get? Anyway, today we have a very special person who is going to give us the Red Cross seminar on, on the evolution of humanitarian law. Now, this is a very special privilege. It's a program and a course that is proprietary to the Red Cross. So the people who are here today will get to see the slides live. Uh, those of you who are tuning into the replay will hear the audio. But to see the images, you'll have to enroll in that course because these belong to the Red Cross. Now, the International Red Cross, of course, is an amazing humanitarian organization. Here in the midst of the most terrible wars, uh, they're out there with their stretchers, picking up people who are damaged and, and injured and getting them out of the battlefield and healing them. I mean, what an incredible organization to be able to serve. It doesn't matter who's fighting who and which is which side or which is the other. For all sides, they're all human beings. And the International Red Cross there is out there serving human beings. And today, our very special guest, uh, Joanne DeFore, is the is a trainer for over 20 years with the Red Cross. And she also does trainings on nuclear war and the TPNW for Rotary, for uh, for all kinds of other organizations. Um, she's a retired teacher and she's a Peace Corps volunteer. And uh, she's been long teaching in uh, the, the subject of international humanitarian law, which is her subject here today. So uh, without further ado, welcome Joanne. I am very privileged to be able to join you today. Uh, I, I, it's especially meaningful, I think, to present this topic right after we were commemorating Memorial Day. Because of course, Memorial Day is a day to honor the, the fallen soldiers. Um, and what we're trying to introduce with humanitarian law is to try to put some kind of curbs on warfare so that we can bring humanity to a situation of warfare. So this is a slideshow of the American Red Cross. Um, I do want to say that I was introduced to this topic by a, a program that was sponsored by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, American Red Cross is, is one part of a very large organization, but I'm proud to be a, a, a volunteer with the American Red Cross. And there's a fascinating story that, that uh, helps us understand what, what was going on that should cause a, a group like the Red Cross to get started. Well, the, um, the creator uh, was a man by the name of Henri Dunant. He was a Swiss citizen that was a businessman. And, and in an effort to do some business, he, he made it certainly his appeal to go to anyone who he felt was going to be appropriate. He wanted to see Napoleon III when he was in a battle in uh, Solferino, and Solferino was in Italy. And as he was heading towards the the, uh, the site to have this meeting, a business meeting with uh, with Napoleon, he passed through the battlefield the day after, the morning after, uh, forty thousand people had been killed on that battlefield. So it was quite an ordeal for his carriage to go through and hear the groans of those men who were still alive, or to see the body parts strewn about. And he couldn't have business on his mind. He had something else on his mind. He went to the church in um, in the Solferino, and he tried to gather up some of the parishioners to help out the victims, the, the soldiers who were still alive. And they brought them to the church, and they catered to them. And when asked which side, because it was the French who were fighting the Austrians on uh, Italian soil, um, that that he said, just bring in the, whichever. I mean, we're, we're worried about dying bodies here. We're not worried about nationalities. So he he managed to have an, an unusual experience then and landed up writing a book 
and the book was called A uh, Memory of Solferino. And that told about his experience and what he concluded that there should be an organization to do this. Well, about the same time was uh, the, over in the United States, there was another humanitarian that, that was called to service. This was Clara Barton. She was a former teacher, so I identify with her. And uh, when the Civil War started, she had she had decided that she was no longer going to be in the classroom because some of her boys that she taught were marching off to, to war. She was from Boston and they were going to join the Union forces. But nevertheless, you know, they were risking. So she decided to volunteer and deliver some, uh, some of the um, supplies that are needed on the battlefield. Anyway, the two of them were going to meet in time. What Enri did was to form a committee and he reached out and he was successful in recruiting the governments of 11 other countries so that there were 12 members, including Switzerland. And they had a meeting in Geneva to establish what was going to be called the International Committee of the Red Cross. Well, why Red Cross? Well, one of the things that they decided, they wanted to try to see if they could set up some, some rules which would control or at least cater to the needs of the soldiers. And so one of the things that um, that they were going to say was that, that they wanted to protect the wounded. They didn't just want them to be abandoned on the field. They wanted to have some kind of a symbol that would show that they are the ones who are the protectors. And they looked at the flag that was flying because they were meeting in Geneva and the Geneva flag or the Swiss flag was a white cross on red. And they said, well, why don't we just do the reverse of a red cross on white? And that became the symbol of the International Committee. And that was an effective organization which actually landed up writing what would be the first Geneva Convention. And as the idea spread around the countries and each country formed their own local chapter, the Americans weren't part of that original group, but they joined later, thanks to Claire Barton. Um, and they decided to uh, make up a logo for their own local chapter. When it reached, um, some of the countries that were not Christian countries or had suffered from the Crusades on the, on the other side, they weren't happy with the idea of a cross. It reminded them of, of the Crusades. So some of them, especially those that were Muslim, created the symbol of the crescent, which was, which was part of their flags. Um, some of the countries wanted their own individual motif to use as the emblem. So the world is made up of many, many red crosses. They're all over the world, but in some cases they call themselves the Red Crescent or the equivalent of the Red Cross as, as would happen in Israel. Um, and, and their mission was going to be the same. One of the things that Clara Barton was going to eventually bring to this new organization after she was finished with her wartime work and of uh, identifying the missing persons, which was a very significant piece that happened after the war. Um, she, she was called to duty when she heard of a, of a flood that had occurred. And it wasn't a wartime situation, but it was a natural disaster. And she went and did the same kind of thing that Henri Dunant did, rallied a group of volunteers to help out in disasters. This idea was going to be brought to the Red Cross and hence we have the International Federation, which is the part of the Red Cross that works specifically with uh, any kind of natural disasters as distinguished from the ICRC, which is the part of the organization that works in wartime. Now, one of the things that evolved over time as the, as the organization grew were the principles that they were going to um, to want to make sure that, that they as an organization prescribe. Now, um, Arthur referenced some of them, but let's go through some of these. The one, the first one, humanity. They really want to try to prevent human suffering wherever it is found. So that means if it's found among the dying soldiers or if it might be found among civilians who were impacted. Their, their position was going to be impartial they are interested in relieving suffering based on real need without discrimination. So regardless of which side in the battle might have, have been impacted, that's where the aid goes. Um, they are neutral. They take no sides in, in hostility 
issues and controversies. And this has worked to their credit because in time, because they cater to, to uh, soldiers on both sides um, or civilians on both sides of the conflict, they oftentimes were given special privileges to reach certain affected groups because the group uh, that was impeding them realized, well, you helped us out when we needed it, so we'll let you through with aid. They are a universal um, uh, Red Cross, which means that every country in the world and every country in the world does belong, they have their own, own equal society. And so there is no rank order among which societies have more clout than any others. They're all equal. And when they get together they to vote, every country has one vote in making policies for the Red Cross. They are um, the voluntary service is is mandatory. They are not paying their staff. I do not get paid for my services, nor does anyone else who read who except there is paid staff, and the paid staff are in charge of organizing the volunteers. And of course, you do need those services. But the the organization as an organization is is primarily staffed. Ninety percent of its of its workers are volunteers. Um, the interesting part is they are independent from their government. So even though some action might be occurring uh, with an enemy government as so perceived, the uh, Red Cross does not regard help as helping an enemy. They are helping human beings and the aid will continue in those cases. Um, and finally, unity. There's only one Red Cross per country. We have had situations where countries have been divided and Red Crosses got divided, but ones like Germany. But once the country got unified, uh, then there became one Red Cross so that there was no competition. And those are what are called fundamental principles, and we'll hear that expression later on. But those were the fundamental principles that motivate and, and uh, absolutely uh, guide the services that are delivered by each Red Cross. Um, but then there's this something called international humanitarian law. Now you might have heard of the expression Geneva Conventions, and I already mentioned the role of Geneva, uh, where the meeting first took place, and that's why that's why the the uh, uh, city name stuck with the conventions. But it's it's uh, it's a law that really talks about humanitarianism. So that's why they they have branded it as international humanitarian law and groups in addition to the Red Cross have signed on to uh, observing and, and implementing humanitarian law. So let's see what it says. International humanitarian law is a set of rules which seek for humanitarian reasons to limit the effects of armed conflict. They are trying to humanize an armed conflict. It protects persons who are not or are no longer participating. Now, those are two distinct categories. They are not means they're civilians. They are no longer participating means they are soldiers who can no longer fight. They're impacted in some way, be they a, a prisoner, be they wounded, uh, or, or for whatever reason they can, they are no longer part of the fight. So those people are the protected people in the hostilities and restricts the means and the methods of warfare. Now, that is a very important role of the Red Cross, to restrict what is allowed. And bear in mind that every country has signed on to these. Okay, uh, We call it the law of armed conflict in the United States, but it is identical to international humanitarian law. Now, in the evolution, this interesting history that goes on, um, I'll be explaining in a while something called customary law. And, and just to give you a brief introduction, customary law was laws that evolved over time through practice, that they were, that the efforts of Henri Dunant were really not original from the point of view of wanting to reduce suffering. Other leaders engaging in other wars have made steps to improve improve the conditions uh, and maybe not kill as brutally as they had been killing, but they had came up with it with a set of practices and and people just described to the practice. It wasn't a treaty of any kind. It was just a a a custom. Well, when we got into um, our civil war, 
We started off with a thousand soldiers in the beginning of the war, and that escalated to a million soldiers. These were raw recruits. They had not been trained and didn't really know of any rules or, or limitations. But President Lincoln reached out to a law professor, and his name was Francis Lieber. He was an immigrant gentleman, but was very, very knowledgeable in what turns out to have been customary law. And he said, and he made the request, would you just write down for the sake of our, our new recruits, what, what are the do's and the don'ts of, of operating? And so that's what Francis Lieber did. He, he had an emotional impact because one of his sons fought for the Confederacy and one of his sons fought for the Union. So he wanted to personally maintain peace in the family. And of course, he wanted to keep both sons alive. So he wrote this code. And he was writing the code just about the same time in Geneva that the countries were meeting and drafting that first Geneva Convention. So there is a painting down in the headquarters of Red Cross in Washington, DC, of Mr. Lieber presenting his code to the folks who were writing that Geneva Convention. And, and a number of those ideas from the code, because he was following customary law, were included in that first Geneva Convention. So the US presence has been there, even if uh, as, a, as a chapter, uh, uh, Clara Barton lobbied and lobbied and lobbied her presidents, but it wasn't until 1882 that the US finally decided to join the, uh, the, the International Committee of the Red Cross. But they are they are permanent members. So let's see what the sources of international law are, because it has evolved over time and has grown in time. So I I hope that you understood uh, what customary law was about. Those practices that uh, really had not necessarily been written down. Lieber was one of the first men to actually codify them, write them down. But in time, there were going to be other practices that were developed within the international community that said, well, you know, um, these, are, these are practices that we believe in because they help humanize the war. So one is, of course, the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Now, if you like, in time, I can explain how they evolved. But after World War II, with all the new techniques and methods and tactics that were used during that war, including the genocide, um, those were revised. And of course, that becomes one of the basis of the, the Geneva Conventions. There are over 600 resolutions. Now, as time evolved and we went into the 60s and the 70s, warfare was taking on a different format, especially when there were liberation groups. And so by the end of, of Vietnam War, which was the ones that we would recognize, they had what they called an additional protocol, which were additions to the Geneva Conventions that really applied more to what the situations were that they were encountering in the 1960s and the 70s. And then in 2005, because there were a number of countries that were questioning the use of the symbol, you'll see how they resolved that in a later slide. But that is another another addition to the the whole regalia of of um, laws that impact um, humanitarian law. There, of course, are specific weapons treaties. We're delighted that um, there was a treaty that prohibited landmines. There was a treaty that prohibited biological weapons. There was a treaty that prohibited chemical weapons, which was extremely successful. And now, recently, a treaty that has outlawed nuclear weapons. And I'll be happy to, to explain that. That's the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And then there have been judicial decisions. Certainly this, the, the uh, decisions coming out of the Nuremberg trials, uh, the decisions coming out of the Tokyo trials, the decisions that were coming out of the International Criminal Court and of all the criminal courts after Rwanda and after Yugoslavia, so those were all judicial decisions that, of course, will affect humanitarian law. And we can see some of those still operating today as the ICC is in Ukraine uh, codifying the war crimes in, in uh, 
in Ukraine. Now, this is a very interesting question, especially for U.S. history. Um, it used to be that, uh, at least according to our Constitution, it is the Senate that has the responsibility to declare war. But the last time we actually declared a war was World War II. You know, it was right after Pearl Harbor. This, the Congress voted to declare a war against Germany and against Japan. And that was the political decision that was made. All the wars that we have fought in, whether it be Afghanistan or Iraq uh, or Yemen, certainly now the wars going on in, in Ukraine, they, they are armed conflicts because there was no declaration of war. And so what they came up with, they wanted to make sure that the IHL could be agreed upon because countries signed on to it. Obviously, some countries have not, have not uh, endorsed it. Uh, or put it into practice, but that's an armed conflict. And so coming out of the decision that was made by the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia is the quote on the side by Dusko Tadish. An armed conflict exists whenever there is a resort to armed forces between states or protected armed violence, between governmental authorities and organized armed groups, or between such groups within a state. But the armed conflict must reach a minimum level of intensity. How can you tell when does something become a, a, an armed conflict or how we would call it a war? And there actually is a group of people out of Geneva, out of the you know, ICRC headquarters that study what's going on. They have to be at least a thousand deaths that have been uh, perpetrated in the armed conflict, there has to be an identification of sides. Some, some leadership is shown on each side and it might be uniformed people or it might just be people with scarves or, or something particular. The parties involved in the conflict must show a minimum of organization. And so that is gonna determine. And once they determine that it is an armed conflict, then the the law of humanitarian law applies, but it has to be it has to be defined that this is now a wartime situation, and if not, then then you you don't apply the terms of the IHL. Now, so what kinds of armed conflicts are there? Well, there are a variety. The first time you're going to see the ones that we mostly think of, and here. When they're talking about states, they're really not talking about our form of states. They're talking about countries. So between two or more countries or nations. There are the 600 articles of the Geneva Conventions plus the uh, additional Protocol 1, which, which deals with international armed conflict. And international means it goes beyond the border, right? But then you have armed conflict within a border. And that's between a country, it's, it's, its national government, and some kind of an armed group, be it a Taliban or be it a, a Boko Haram group, within or between multiple non-state armed groups. Sometimes they're fighting with each other. Um, and in those cases, uh, the entire range of IHL does not apply, but 29 articles do apply. And so those are spelled out in, you know, you can go to the Geneva Conventions and you can find out which articles would apply in a non-armed conflict situation. And then there are internal tensions or disturbances. We have certainly seen over the last few years, well, back in our history, we had a number of times where there were internal tensions. And these are not applicable for IHL because they usually have not met the criteria of 1,000 dead. And these are going to be more local situations, which are handled by the criminal codes within the respective country. And so that's when the um, conditions for Im imposing the IHL does not apply. Now, now we're going to think of for all those organizations which ascribe to IHL, that's the Red Cross and beyond Red Cross. These are the fundamental principles that they all will have all agreed to. 
So it's a broader category than just the principles that we said before of universality and independence and that kind of thing. Now we're talking about just, just armed forces all over the world and uh, whatever format they take. Now, under, under the fundamental principles of humanitarian law, there is a condition called military necessity. Now, military necessity means in the terms of the military, it's, well, you know, war's war, we can do anything we want. Well, no, you can't. That's where IHL steps in. We're going to put the Red Cross and those, those organizations that ascribe to humanitarian law said, no, anything does not go. And these are the conditions that we are applying for you. So we'll, we'll introduce these next three um, principles. Military necessity starts off with what it's a war. There's going to be killing that goes on in war. You'll notice in the protection of individuals, soldiers are not protected as once they are uh, uh, once they are engaged in the fighting, they are not necessarily protected by AHL until and unless they become a fallen soldier or until or unless they become a POW, a prisoner of war. But other than that, they are free to act as soldiers and to kill. What are the provisions that, that they can operate? Well, if it's the nature of warfare and you have tanks and you have airplanes and they're designed and, and equipment that is designed specifically for warfare, that's allowed. Okay. Um, even some of the weaponry that we hear, you know, some of our, our national terrorists who go in and shoot up in schools legal for the military, but and some people are trying to make them illegal for non-military use now. But that is uh, a, a provision of, of, that's what war is all about. There's also a provision considering use. Now, ordinarily a school bus would be protected and a school bus would not be a target because school buses carry kids to school unless they happen to be taken over by armed troops and, and are masquerading as a school bus, then it becomes a target because their use has been, has been changed. The other item might be a bridge. In other words, a location, a physical location that would ordinarily be a target. For example, if you're on one side of the bridge and you're afraid that the enemy might cross over the bridge, you would think of blowing up the bridge. And we've seen movies about that, right? Bridge over the River Kwai. Um, but there might be situations in which if there are negotiations going on between two sides and the soldier in the field doesn't know that, he might be getting an order, he or she might be getting an order to not target the bridge. And so that all depends on the government deciding what's happening because the government controls what the military will do. The fourth is the purpose. Now a purpose is um, designated as serving some good here. Now, distinction is my favorite, of course, because they're trying to distinction and, and civilians are never, ever to be targeted. And we have a, a case in here where the civilian drivers of a tank that is open to being targeted because it was carrying um, supplies to the enemy, but they notified the, the civilian drivers to get away because they were going to bomb it. So that's the kind of actions that the military must be taken. And civilian objects and military objectives must be distinguished. You never, ever target a civilian object. We can see how that has been abused by in the current war. And combatants must distinguish themselves. The other control is that you must distinguish. You must show that you are a combatant. Okay, that, that um, so uniforms or some form of designation that you are part of the enemy must be warned to distinguish that you know you're not a civilian because uh, if you're a civilian i'm not supposed to shoot at you but of course these have been violated as well and so um the rules are set down if if people abide by the rules maybe there would be less suffering but we still have to make sure that they are that they are applied proportionality is a is an issue that is uh, again when, when an act of, of war is disproportional to a military target, that you are super bombing something because you're angry, not because that uh, you need to do it to achieve your military advantage, your strategic uh, goal, um, 
but if but those kind of disproportionate activities are outlawed and limited and unnecessary suffering well of course they're trying to do that uh the elimination of landmines was one because of the after effects of the landmines um so this is this is a very very important uh, effort to make sure that in any, even in a drone situation, that the, you're limiting unnecessary suffering. And I just watched a movie last night. I recommend strongly "Eye in the Sky," uh, Helen Mirren show, which shows how how confusing and how important it is to make sure that these rules are. And, and they do a beautiful job in that movie. You can see it on YouTube, Eye in the Sky. Just type in YouTube, Eye in the Sky, and watch to see how these uh, fundamental principles are applied. Now, who was protected? Well, a whole group of people, wounded and sick, combatants, and that's an important piece, prisoners of war, civilians, obviously. Now, in the military, the medical personnel that are military, think of MASH, the program MASH, it's still around. Um, and also any of the medical equipment that is used is supposed to be, now we know that hospitals have been bombed and of course that's an illegal act, it's a war crime. And that's what the ICC is, is uh, designating. Okay, religious personnel, chaplains of all faiths are, are designated as, as protected under IHL. And of course, Red Cross and other personnel. And what is protected? Well, civilian property that really impacts, you know, like you, you don't bomb a water supply. Okay, you don't buy an electrical plant, something that, that definitely would affect civilian life. Cultural and historic sites. There have been times, especially even in World War II, when specific cathedrals that are that are beautiful works of art were not were, were spared from the bombing. And that was all a deliberate intention. Um, religious facilities, objects indispensable for the survival of civilian population. Uh, and works containing dangerous forces. Of course, we hear about Zapor Zaporizhia, you know, the, um, the nuclear power plant and how dangerous that situation has been and the, and the uh, back and forth between whether who's controlling it and what's happening. And of course, the natural environment, you're trying to protect uh, nature. Now, these are the distinct developments. I, I mentioned the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. And now what they decided for any country that doesn't want to use either of those, for example, Israel, but there are others as well, they're, they're using the crystal shape. And you can put whatever logo you want in the center of the crystal shape. But that's how they would want you to display any aid that you are given, especially if you're given aid across the borders. Okay, that, that aid should be earmarked. So these are distinctive emblems. The emblem of protection, when you see the Red Cross, you are supposed to not attack it, especially on, on the equipment. And so that is that is a very important obligation. And the other use of the symbols is what they say, indicative use. It's a distinctive. So that's why I'm wearing a Red Cross vest. Whenever I do anything for Red Cross, I am supposed to identify myself as a Red Cross volunteer, my my badge and my um, and my bins, my pins, I don't help identify me. So that is part of the indicative use, and that that you are saying, please, I'm I'm here for help. I'm not here for for fighting. That kind of closes our our slideshow. Well, thank you so much, Joanne. That was just uh, an incredibly important uh, presentation and very educational for me, and I think for all of us. You know, I think I find we find myself. I find myself in an interesting position. Here we are, a human race who, in every single country in the world, it's illegal to kill people, and then somehow beyond borders, we haven't made it illegal. Uh, you can kill people in wars, but now we've tried to put some certain certain adjustments on. Well, how much can you kill people outside of, and to try to refine that. Uh, and um, you know, it's very interesting that uh, well, on the one hand. Uh, it seems like a kind of ridiculous way that humans have invented to solve problems. You know, we'll see who can kill the most of the other people and that'll decide who should have this territory or who's right and wrong. seems like there could be a better way. But since we do have that, the Red Cross seems to be functioning in that melu where, okay, you've got your right to kill each other, but how are we gonna, gonna fix that and modify it so that it's just not doing incredibly extra harm that's not, not your intended purpose. 
And um, I wonder, maybe you could just briefly tell us kind of the evolution of these Geneva Accords. Uh, you've told us a lot about that history already, but is there anything you want to add to that, uh, the evolution of how humanity has uh, managed to begin to contain uh, this monster we created called war? Yeah, it was, it's very interesting. Every time we had, we had a wartime situation and saw something happening, then there was that kind of like the aha moment. So they would meet on a regular basis. And after the Spanish American war, they said, well, why, why haven't we protected sailors? You know, there's an awful lot of fighting that goes on, on, on water. So convention number two was written and it kind of came into effect in 1908. Then comes world war one. And among other things in World War One, prisoners were taken in vast numbers. And how were those prisoners treated? And should they be treated better? Well, that came with the evolution of Convention Number Three, and then Convention Number Four obviously talked about civilians with the genocide that had occurred. So that was so so the and and the the IHL keeps on growing, depending on any new way, shape, or form. Probably we're, we're going to have to look at artificial intelligence in war. And what is going to be allowed and not allowed, or cyber warfare? What is, what would be allowed and not allowed? Because those are you know those are cutting edge methods of of uh, trying to reach destruction. And those certainly are cutting edge. Uh, and then we have a lot of good questions in the chat. But I just want to ask one more. Uh, you know, all of your regulations you've mentioned have stressed not to target civilians, and yet it seems like the very nature of nuclear weapons is to say will destroy all the civilians in the city uh, <laughs> to deter you. And, uh, you know, you look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I mean, clearly this is just, the target is civilians. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work you've been doing on the uh, TPNW, the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons, uh, how, how that evolved, how the Red Cross was involved, and how that might help us uh, rise above uh, the greatest threat to the very existence of life on Earth? Well, yes. First of all, right after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Red Cross uh, from Geneva sent over a man. He got there about two weeks after uh, Hiroshima, and he wrote back this scathing report as to how horrific things were. Of course, he missed he missed all the dis disintegrating bodies and the melting bodies. By that time, you know the the, the people that were horribly horribly burned to death were dead. But he could see the effects of the radiation, all right? So from that point on, the International Committee of the Red Cross said nuclear weapons should never, ever be used again. And they declared that. Now, of course, the United States had them, right? So individual chapters of the Red Cross have governments that have gone down the nuclear path. But from the point of view of International Committee of the Red Cross, that's why American Red Cross is independent of that. And they take a neutral stand on the treaty where our government takes a, a negative, definite negative stand. No, of course, we we need them for national security. We have to have our weapons. And so that's that's part of the issue. They they have this treaty where enough countries who were inspired by the words of Peter Moore, who spoke to them. He the, was the head of the Red Cross at the time of the ICRC. And he and he spoke to them. We had enough countries in the United Nations that they they decided that they were going to go ahead and make a treaty to eliminate, prohibit, ban the use of nuclear weapons. And that's the treaty that came into effect officially 2021. So that that made history because they never thought they would get a, a treaty that outlawed nuclear weapons. But we now have it and we have 68 countries that have ratified it. And we have the efforts going on by the group that won the Nobel Peace Prize, the international campaign to uh, abolish nuclear weapons. We have them on board uh, organizing and helping the countries to implement the provisions of the treaty, which are very, very thorough. So there is hope that maybe, maybe in our lifetimes, maybe that they will be abolished. Great. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Melanie to handle the questions, but she has taken the initiative uh, to create a page where we can sign up as individuals and as citizens of the world uh, endorse the Treaty for Prevention of Nuclear Weapons. So uh, thank you for an extraordinary presentation. And here's uh, our co-host uh, and producer of the program, Melanie Bennett. Well, my goodness. Yes. Thank you for saying that, Arthur, slash indoors. You want to go? And and yes, Joanne, I think 
in our lifetime, this is going to happen, I think. And it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So we're going to uh, right, all right, right now, nuclear weapons are banned. So let's all get together and enforce and honor the TPNW. Yes. Okay. Now, Joanne, of course, you're an amazing teacher. You're a teacher of teachers. We're so grateful to have you do this. This is an incredible program. I learned so much myself. Joanne, would you mind? We'd love to you to introduce uh, Mariana, if you would, right now. We'll do that before the Q&A, and then we'll go right to David. I hope David can hang with us. Stay with us, David. Okay, Joanne, a quick introduction. Yeah, it's my uh, privilege to introduce a woman I work with. Uh, she's a staff person for, and she works on on helping to organize these trainings. Um, and her name is Mariana Bellinger, and she is with us this morning. Welcome back. <laughs> and if you'd like to just say hello to folks, that would be wonderful. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, this is our one of three of our uh, presentations that we do. We're chartered with the Department of Defense to provide these presentations, and this is our one-hour presentation we also have a four hour presentation, which can be used as a college credit. And then we have an eight hour presentation. If you're feeling uh, energetic on a weekend, um, we have an eight hour presentation as well. So if you're interested in any of these, please let me know. I will put my email in the chat. Um, we are so grateful for volunteers like Joanne that come on and educate others about international law. So again, thank you so much. And it's great having all of you here today. Oh, thank you, Mariana. And now we're gonna go to David Gallup. David, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah hey, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, for this presentation. I studied, uh, uh, well, human rights law and international humanitarian law in law school. And then now working at World Service Authority as a human rights organization, the, the thing that, that I've come to realize is, is it's really, it's more a comment than I guess a question or a concern. You know, how can we have law that says that that killing in certain circumstances is okay? That that doesn't sit right with me. How can we, you know, uh, have a law that's based on an anarchic act? I mean, necessity. Well, at what country or what government isn't going to say that the, the killing they're doing is isn't necessary what uh, with the weapons that we have nowadays how can there be any proportionality we know that 80 percent of all deaths in war now are, are civilians there's no distinction anymore between civilians and combatants and one of the things i make clear to the law students that i teach so the legal interns who come here is that it's like a, a, an x uh in peacetime human rights is way up here but as war starts uh you know as war you know uh is happening mm -hmm. human rights start disappearing and then humanitarian law takes takes over but uh when a full-fledged international conflict there's supposed to be at least four non-derogable rights or five you know no torture uh, no ens uh, enslavement um no killing of combatants or i mean of, of civilians i mean but even those go out the window so mm -hmm. my point is uh why are we i mean i get why there's international humanitarian law but i find it reprehensible i guess that's why i guess that's my comment we really should be focused on human rights law and not that i don't appreciate what the red cross you know has done and is doing for helping people around the world it just really frustrates me that we're you know we're focusing on like trying to put regulations on something that is just wrong inherently anyway and i and i have to leave it at two because i've got another zoom but i'd really appreciate hearing your comments thank you thank you david i couldn't agree with you more <laughs> even <laughs> though i am a trainer but uh and you know the, i people are so ignorant of what humanitarian law was you actually heard it referenced by by groups in the beginning of the ukraine war they would say you know we endorse international humanitarian law you never heard that from any legislators you never heard it from anybody and suddenly this becomes an issue, but nobody knows what it's about. And we're supposed to hold our legislators accountable when we're violating things, right? But if you don't know that, that it's illegal, then then you're not even ready to say to your legislators, wait a second, we're we're doing the wrong thing. So it's so it's a big part of it, I think, is is um insufficient education. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both. And now let's go to Barbara Mueller. 
Thank you. You know, um, Joanne, you couldn't have said it better, and David either. You know, it's time for us to do the impossible, as Nelson Mandela said. It always seems impossible until it's done. So we are offering a course, and it is called Ending War 101, Making the Impossible Possible. And it's only a six-hour course, and it is offered through the Rotary Action Group for Peace and the World Beyond War. And, you know, until you have the words the voice, the human voice, and the rationale, as David said, in sound bites, people aren't going to stop war. We have to figure out a way, like my late husband, Robert Mueller did. He said, never give up your voice, never give up your optimism, and continue to believe that war is not going to happen. Continue to believe that war is not going to happen. Because what are you thinking now? War is here. In a way, you are endorsing war by silence. I remember Martin Luther King when the Vietnam War started. He said, it's a sin to be quiet when I know war is impossible to stop. But it's a sin that we have to acknowledge. So I just want you all to take this course with me. It starts in June. It's a video course. You do it online. You do it at your own leisure. And if you're interested, I'll send you the QR code. My email is in the chat box. And I really thank you for today, Joanne. You know, I think of you like Florence Nightingale. She was my hero. You know, when I was a little girl, I was reading stories about Florence Nightingale, Claire Barton. And now the Red Cross is giving awards for the heroes of our stories. And, you know, I don't want our heroes to be dead. I don't want to have dead heroes. I want real heroes who live a life of fulfillment and joy. Thank you all for this coming together with us today because it opens up our eyes again, Joanne. And the Red Cross is phenomenal. Thank you so much, Barbara. That uh, This is so rich. I have, this is fabulous. So thank you. We, we all need to learn. And uh, we all need to learn how to not have these wars. So let's go now to Michael. Michael, go right ahead. So uh, the question is, what is the maybe the coming together of the, these many peace organizations, or how could we unify uh, the many voices for peace into like a real peace movement? Because we see so much in the news, and we see United States is sending more weapons, and Germany is going to send more tanks, and, and in all this escalation, of course, Ukraine does need to be defended. But on the other hand, you know, I don't hear talk of, you know, a big movement for a ceasefire or a, or a peace plan or, or any kind of structure. So that's my question. Well, the, the contacts that I have are promoting a ceasefire and negotiation strongly. But a question is how, how big and how powerful are we to get our message out? Um, because there is uh, there are a number of, of leaders now that are that are calling directly for negotiations because the escalation is unreasonable and the war can't be won on either side and um, and but but not to admit that and to say oh yes we're going to win we're gonna, I mean it's this football mentality that usually drives me crazy but um, you can tell I'm not a supporter of football but um, <laughs> that's all right you know you can you can you can uh, live with that I think. But um, but that's an excellent that's an excellent question, and I I think we're still lacking that kind of leadership. I I think we don't have those voices yet. We don't have those religious voices. We do have the Pope, you know, and and he has come out strongly. And you know, he was there, you know, uh, notifying the G seven people to to take measures, you know, at the G seven meeting. And so, but but that's not enough. He doesn't have the American bishops behind him. He has two. That we know of, um, uh, but and in the rest of the world, well, Latin America. I mean, of all the countries that have ratified the treaty, yes, yes, their constituencies are in support of abolition and and coming together for peace. And and uh, but it's a slow process. You, we're so ingrained with war is necessary and war is fun and war is is just war is our national security. Well, hell no, uh, it's, it's not. normalized. Yeah, it's normalized. Yeah. Uh, did the United States ever sign the ban uh, of landmines? Did the United no. States United States no. become a signatory, and why is that? North Korea, uh, the the DMZ in Korea. It's filled with landmines, and and we will not until it gets demilitarized. Then then they are are using that as an excuse for not signing it. 
But every other country did. I mean, they're, you know, and, and their you. implementation through peacekeepers was wonderful. Wow. Shameful. Um, mm -hmm. I know Amy has a lot to say. Amy, go right ahead. Yes. And um, there are, of course, so many pieces of, of questions. You can't address them all, but I'll just go into the moral injury aspect where um, so many times these Geneva quaint Geneva Convention rules are seen as uh, protecting civilians. But in truth, many see them as protecting the veterans because military, most military have to live with what they've done afterwards. And it's, it's very difficult. There are suicides, there's diminished life in many, many ways, an uh, incredible amount of, I call it um, invisible injury. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, you know, the, the, it seems to me that the issue could be made stronger when we bring in the impact on veterans, that this is not just about civilians, but that by following a code of conduct, uh, adhering to it, um, you've got a better chance of uh, a healthy life in the aftermath. Well, in the first training that I got with IHO, we would show how if a, a soldier saw uh, a colleague uh, violating Geneva Conventions, killing a baby, you know, torturing a prisoner, doing something they weren't allowed to do, he should rat on that person. He should, or if you are told to uh, designate to, in the drone movie, for example, that, that um, Eye on the Sky movie, the people who were empowered to press the drone strike, they knew that they were going to kill a little girl. They knew it because they could actually see it. In, in those cases, those people should refuse and have the authority to refuse because it is an illegal act. But how, how many people would rat on their buddies? Would, you know, would, it, but that's exactly the way that you enforce it is just, I'm not going to do this. Well, it happened in Melai. There were soldiers who refused to kill in Melai because they were all senior citizens and, and children, you know, that you were killing and they just absolutely refused. And they had to fight their comrades who were willing to kill them, you know? And so you had Americans fighting Americans in Melai. Hmm. And we used to teach about that in, in IHL, you know, how important I it was to be really centered. And then when you ask, if you ask the veterans, well, how often did you hear about Geneva Conventions? It's depending on what group, because we used to have people come. You know, I mean, if it were if it were anybody in the Navy that said, oh, my God, again and again and again and again, my gosh, I can recite it in my sleep. The Marines would usually laugh at us. Sorry. I mean, I'm generalizing, but, you know, there's some, are you kidding? Oh, come on, Geneva Conventions. Come on, wimps. Well, that's why we no. thank you, Joanne, because no. you're not citing. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yes, this has been so wonderful. And um, Joanne, we could talk. Everyone should take the classes. Helen Peacock is teaching it. She is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And her work has been tremendous. So and she's the one that did the Ending War 101. She put it together. Yeah. And um, because, you know, she's very passionate about peace, as we all are. But we haven't had the course on how to end war. We've had courses on everything under the sun. But how do you end war? Ending War 101. I want really to thank you, Joanne, because you and the Red Cross are our heroes out there, the people who save those who are wounded. And these wounded, the walking wounded are not necessarily yeah. shot. They're just wounded because of what they've been through. And the walking wounded, I want warriors that don't go to war. I want warriors to save our nature, to save our forests and all the other things that we value on the planet. So I love that. And bless Red Cross. And they, and they do help both sides, which I really appreciate. Yeah. And we've had stories of of, uh, of them, really. The fact that they would help both sides would oftentimes allow them, if if one side were occupying an area that, that people were starving, right? But they knew that in times past, you helped our side. Then they would let the convoys through to bring food. And, and those, we get documentation of that all the time when you get people who have been in refugee situations. So the neutrality principle is wonderful. Of course, usually a government that really wants to make sure that you're going to kill the enemy it doesn't necessarily agree. So that's when we say we're independent. So important. You can, you can, you know, you can say what you want to say. We believe in what we want to do, and we do that. And 
we'll just live with each other. Okay. So someday we agree. Oh, so important and uh, incredible work. Just, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine being in those situations. We'll do one more quick question or comment from Robert. Robert Reed, go right ahead. I'm a retired physician here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Something that uh, Arthur Canegas said uh, to do with the uh, war generally and a couple of others of you have expressed uh, where in all the countries for individuals to commit one murder is a serious event. Mm. And yet when with, the, with this concept of war and uh, a war being on that people who go into the military are trained not just to courageously protect their country, but to be mass killers. And the better, the more mass killing they can do, the more Victoria Crosses and so on they get. And so I expressed this at one of those Rotarian meetings and the three veterans in the crowd really called me out on, on my calling out of this traditional um, uh, honoring of veterans every November because they valiantly went to war to protect their country and um, give their lives. But they also went and the reasons the ones who came back came back and that they won the war was that they killed more people. And so they were mass killers. And immediately these uh, retired veterans, uh, all three came on again, extolling the role of the veterans. And I was trying to say from a different perspective, from the perspective of having wars that um, uh, I think one word that may help and eventually this maybe it could be used in the six or eight hour course and so on wars are stupid if we could connect the word stupid with wars as a simultaneous psychological response wars are stupid eisenhower in a talk actually used that phrase that wars are stupid and they are because the per perpetrators of a war the ones who go on the offensive the ones who win actually lose because in most cases whatever they won in the war has been over counterbalanced by the loss human loss of even their own side let alone the opposition so it's just stupid to do it. Joanne, did you have anything in response? And then we've got to close. I kept on thinking, you know, I, I uh, fell in love with a man who didn't go to Vietnam, but joined the Peace Corps. There are those choices. Um, and, and, you know, Peace Corps people are my heroes. Um, yes. And, uh, or those people who made those kind of decisions to work for peace. Yes. Humanitarian issues. They're, they're yeah. my heroes. And I want to thank them for their service. Because yeah. you're not hearing that recognition being given, and, and it should be. Yes, like Frank. We have Frank here today. And the, yes, and I love what Barbara said about let's protect the environment. There's lots of things to protect. And so we don't have to, you know, eh, go to war. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And back to Arthur. Take it away. Well, Joanne, that was just truly extraordinary. We've learned so much. And we are so grateful to you and look forward to having many of us join your course. And I hope all of you will come back next week uh, and every week for the continuing episodes of the People Powered Planet podcast. World citizen, lift up your voices. Oh, you know we got something to say. All we need is the same directions heading in one way. One way.